Thank you, Pastor Christine. Good morning, everybody. What an awesome looking crowd. Wow, you guys. Really, turn to someone next to you and say, You look marvelous today. You really do. You look marvelous, darling. You look good. All right, not that good. But you, you know, you're, no, I'm kidding. You look what? <laughs> I'm teasing. You look great. Some of you don't know me, so you don't know whether to laugh or not, and it's okay. Um, so I'm Pastor Joel. Pastor Emeritus, I guess, is my official title, which means I'm the old guy that helped start it, and now they just wheel me out once in a while and then put me away. Quick, get, me, you know, get out of here. Yeah. So um, my wife and I travel. We're here once in a while, but we do most of our work remote. We visit pastors and their families and ministry leaders and their families and missionaries, and we're cheerleaders. Basically, we try to encourage them. We try to support them. We pray for them. We try to keep more of them in, in the ministry uh, because, as many of you may know, especially post-COVID, there have been a lot of people that have left ministry, a lot of churches with empty pulpits. So we here at Lifeway are very blessed to have so many that are serving and to have uh, Pastor Steve and his wife and Pastor Christine and Pastor Amy and others who just serve here and want to serve here and continue to serve here. Uh, trust me, not every congregation that we visit and work with is, is so blessed and has some of them don't have full-time pastors right now. So we can praise the Lord for that. Amen? amen. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Clearly. So um, I am excited about sharing with you uh, the next installment in the Battles of the Bible. When Pastor Steve first told me, I thought I was going to have to duke it out with somebody up here, but I guess that wasn't the intent of the, of the thing. I'm kind of old for that now, so I'd have to pick a very small, you know, maybe old employee, uh, opponent. But anyway, no, this is where we talk about what? That God is involved in the affairs of men. And throughout Scripture, there are many times that God's people go to war, and we see God's hand in that. And that's something that we're being reminded of through this series. And when Pastor Steve asked me to take this particular battle, the Battle of the Red Sea, um, at first he was kind of apologetic. He said, oh, you know, I know that Israel didn't really fight a battle here, but, but you know, Egypt did and God did. And I said, it's okay. This is good. I, I like this. this. This would have been a, a first choice for me uh, in the series because it really demonstrates some things that I think are critical to our daily Christian life as we face our enemy as we face battles and challenges and times when we feel trapped. So if you would stand with me as we read a passage that we're going to use as our primary text, we always like to stand and show that we believe it's God's Word, not the Word of men, right? Amen? We know this is God's mind in print, so we're going to take it as such and learn from it. We're going to read together, not a long one, we won't tire you out today, we won't wear you out. Uh, Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14. I want you to read really loud. Wake up the person next to you, okay? Here we go. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And Lord, we thank you for your word and for preserving it for us. Thank you, God, for the fact that we get to understand some of the elements of your character, your nature, and how you work with your people from Genesis to Revelation. But God, I pray that this would not just be an opportunity to, to, to hear a story or even just to learn a couple lessons, but this would be a time of transformation where every one of us, as we face battles, would face them differently especially when it seems hopeless and we feel helpless. God, help us today to be transformed by truth, your truth, that we might live out a life that honors and glorifies you and helps transform the lives of others. And we thank you that you would do that miracle in Jesus' name. Amen. Give someone a hug, a high five, punch in the arm. Not too hard, but it is, you know, battles of the Bible. So, and then have a seat. You're good. Don't hurt them. Don't hurt them. Now, I think everybody in this room knows that God is always present even when you and I feel trapped, right? How many know that? God's always there, yeah. Should be every hand, everybody should know. We know God is there, right? However, 
And I know this would not be true of you because I see your halos glowing brightly out there. But if you're like me, there are times when I do not act like I know that to be true. That there are times when I feel trapped, I feel helpless, I feel hopeless and hapless, and I begin to whine. And what comes out of my mouth does not reflect confidence in that reality of his presence and his purpose being fulfilled. And so as we look at the story of God's people, Israel, being chased down to the Red Sea by the Egyptian army, and we watch not just what happened in the miraculous deliverance, but what happened prior to it, I think there's some lessons for us about what to do when we feel trapped. And we may be trapped or feel trapped in a lot of different ways. Some of us feel trapped with health issues we can't overcome, and we've tried hard, and we've done everything that we're supposed to do, but it doesn't seem to go away. Some of us feel trapped with job situations we're in. I remember once I worked for a company in Princeton, New Jersey, many years ago before I was in ministry, and I had a boss who wanted to get rid of me because she felt jealous. She thought that I was trying to take her job because I was friends with her boss's boss. And I had been friends with him for years before I even started working there, but she was convinced that I had come there and I was going to try to talk trash about her and get her booted so I could take her job. I didn't want her job. You couldn't pay me. There's enough money on the planet to do her. I didn't want it, but she thought I did. And so she took it upon herself to do everything possible to make my life miserable so I would quit. And I am not exaggerating. I mean, this woman came up with some pretty creative ways to try to frustrate me. Like she would assign me a job and then secretly assign it to somebody else so that when I showed up to do it, they were there. And we'd look at each other and go, why, why? well, you know, Bev said, I'm supposed to do this. And so I would come back and say something, and then she'd yell at me for complaining. And this kind of thing was going on and other things for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. I didn't feel like I could go and complain because then I would be fulfilling her prophecy. So I didn't think I could speak up. I didn't couldn't just walk away from the job because we were newly married. I think our son had just been born, so we had a baby. I couldn't just quit. Karen wasn't working at the time. She was taking care of the baby. So I couldn't just walk. I felt trapped. I felt helpless. And no matter how hard I prayed about it and how much I you know, cried out to God, it just seemed that it wasn't going to change. I remember another time I was, uh, this was before I was... Um, working full-time. When I was still in college, I worked part-time as a security guard on our little campus in, in Texas. I say little campus. It was actually a huge campus. And I worked third shift. And one night, about three o'clock in the morning, as I was on patrol, I was by myself. There was no one else on duty. There was a dispatcher, and that's it. I was the only one out and about. And I saw a light in a building way off on the far side of campus where there was no one else and no one living or staying nearby. There was a light in the second floor of a warehouse that wasn't supposed to be on, in a building that nobody was supposed to be in. And the door was open, the light was on, and it was 3 a.m. And I knew that I had to go check it out. And I also knew that I wasn't armed. I had a flashlight slash nightstick, that was it. And as I got out of the car and I started walking up the steps to, to that second floor loft, it just occurred to me, I can't back out. I'm the only one here. But if I walk up to the top of those stairs and there's somebody there who's armed, he's going to hear me coming. I'm going to be a sitting duck. And this could be the end. And I remember standing on the stairwell thinking this through and realizing I really didn't have a choice. But I definitely felt trapped. I felt like I couldn't, I, I had no other way out than to face this and hope for the best. Some of you are nodding because there are situations in your life right now where you feel stuck. You feel like you've tried everything, and yet it's not changing. And, and what we see in the story of Israel here at the Red Sea is the reality not just of God's deliverance, but how he expects his people to respond when they feel trapped, when they feel stuck. And there's some truths behind this that can really transform our lives. Some principles that we can learn to apply through the power of the Holy Spirit to make all the difference in the world for us, but also for people around us. 
And here's the big idea. I'm going to give you that. And this is actually your first fill-in too. Even when you feel boxed in and hopeless, God can still fight and win your battles. So choose prayer and positivity over panic and pouting. Choose prayer over panic. Choose to be positive over pouting. I want you to turn to somebody and tell them, choose prayer over panic there, dude. Tell them. Go ahead. Look them in the eye and tell them. Choose prayer over panic. How do we do that? What does that look like? And that's what we're going to walk through today. Now, I'm going to give you your first point, uh, and I don't, I don't want to forget this, and I, there's a lot to this one, but let me give you the fill-in first. Number one, we, if we're going to make this choice, if we're going to live this out, number one, we have to recognize that God will sometimes allow, I could even say sometimes create, but allow impossible situations for His purpose. For His purpose. I remember in Haiti years ago, I might have, I think I've shared this story here before. We were serving with a group of people doing a, a kind of a triage health clinic and um, helping a church that was a new church plant in Port-au-Prince, City Solidaire in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And um, we had people serving with us. And it came time for lunch, and there was a, a lot of starvation and hunger in Port-au-Prince at the time. So they would lock the gates, seal the gates before they would bring the food out because there might be a riot, and especially little ones would get hurt. So they were going to kick out the locals who had been helping us so that they could serve us, the missionaries, lunch. And I said, no. They've been here all day too. We're not kicking them out. They've served right along with us. We lock the gate, fine, but don't kick them out first. We'll split up whatever we have. We'll serve it. Okay, so they locked the gate. Everybody stayed. A few minutes later, I'm walking around looking, and everybody's eating a sandwich. Everybody in the place has got a sandwich. And I went to the cook, and I said, how many sandwiches did you make? She said, I don't know. That's weird, Pastor. This is, I don't understand what's going on. I said, what do you mean? She said, I only made sandwiches for the, for the maybe dozen or so missionaries, but everybody got one when we handed them out. And there's nobody coming in because the gates are locked. And I'm the only one who brought food. And I said, oh my goodness, he can do not just fish and loaves, but he can do peanut butter and jelly too. <laughs> See, sometimes I think he puts us in these situations or allows us to be in them so he can demonstrate his glory. That is definitely true here, as we'll see. But before I read you the first four verses of this chapter, I, I, I want you to recognize that within Christianity, there are extremes. And quite often, as I'm fond of saying, when you find the extremes and you draw a line down the middle, you'll find Jesus standing on that line going, hello, I never moved. You moved, I did not. Let me explain to you what I mean. When it comes to the idea of difficult situations or impossible situations and where God is in that, there are those in one extreme who suggest that God is sovereign and that means, and I believe he's sovereign too, but their definition of sovereignty means he does all kinds of cruel and difficult things just to prove how powerful he is. And that if, I've even heard, I heard one pastor not long ago say, if you're in a difficult or impossible situation or you're, you're suffering some trial, don't try to get out of it. God put you there. <laughs> really? You sure about that, buddy? I mean, I, I, I believe God can do anything he wants, and he does do some things that I don't always understand. But God is not a bully. God is not an abusive father or abusive husband. Sometimes husbands think that that's the model of what they're supposed to be like. Just do it because I said so. Ugh. Really? You think that's God? You think that's how he operates? Or is he more loving than that? You see, sometimes I think many difficult circumstances we end up in, we get there all by ourselves without God having to do a thing. Now again, I see the halos, so bear with me. None of you would understand this maybe, but I'll speak for me. When I'm in a pinch, many times if I look back, I realize I'm the one that created that. I walked in. If I go out of here today and I do 90 miles an hour down the Berlin Turnpike and I get pulled over and I jump out of the car and punch the cop in the nose, I cannot tonight stand in the jail going, why have you done this to me, Lord? Well, I could, but that'd be pretty stupid, wouldn't it? Did God do that to me? No. 
In that case, I did that to me. And sometimes that's the case. Other times, other people do stupid and mean and rotten things, and we suffer for it. God doesn't stop it. I'll give you that. Sometimes he lets it go, and he may have a purpose in letting it go. That's, we'll come to that. But we can't look back at him and say, well, I just, God's showing how powerful he is. He put me in this situation because he wants to see me. Really? Be careful with that. That's an extreme. But there's another extreme. The other extreme is that no matter what happens, no matter what we go through, any health trial, any um, financial trial, any job trial, any relationship trial, all we got to do is pray hard enough and believe enough, name and claim what we want, and boom, God's going to take it away just like that. And if he doesn't, it's just because we didn't pray hard enough, and we didn't fast enough, and we just have to have more faith. And we define faith as a feeling. Something we've worked up, we believe it enough, and God's going, okay, okay, all right, Joel, all right, I'll let you have it, because you believe so much, I got to do it. That's not faith. The Bible says faith comes from hearing the message, the message is heard by the word of Christ. What does that mean? It means faith comes from what he says, not what I want, or what I think should happen, or when I think it should happen. So just as it's wrong to say every bad thing that happens to you, God did it, it's also wrong to say that just all you got to do is just quick, quick pray and believe hard enough, and God's going to go, okay, I'll take it away, just like that. I love Johnny Erickson Tata. Some of you know who she is. She's a great teacher and, and believer, an author, who's paralyzed from the neck down, has been for many, many years. They asked her once, aren't you upset that God hasn't healed you? Now, you seem like a woman of faith. Don't you have the faith to be healed? And in so many words, she said, in essence, I, don't, I have the faith not to be. She actually said this. She said, I thank God every day for this wheelchair. And the, and the interviewer was like, what? What are you talking about? She said, if I didn't have this wheelchair, who would listen to me? But when I roll out on the stage and I preach about the goodness of God, the grace of God, the power of God, and the power of salvation by faith in Jesus, millions pay attention. So I thank God every day for this platform that I'm sitting in. Now that's a lot of faith right there. You talk about faith, there's faith. But is it the faith that she claimed her healing and walked out of the wheel? No, it's a different kind, isn't it? But it's real faith though. Can't question that, can we? So when we look at the fact that God sometimes allows these situations, we may not on this side of heaven understand why. There are times we will, but there are other times we won't understand why. But we can know that he is loving and faithful. He grieves with us when we grieve. When Jesus allowed Lazarus to die, after his sisters called him to come to heal him when he was sick, and he waited on purpose and let him die, and they yelled at him when he arrived, if you'd been here, our brother wouldn't have died. He didn't correct them because they were right. But what happened? As he was walking to the tomb, we know the miracle he did. He raised him from the dead. We get it. But they didn't know that yet. Nobody knew yet what was going to happen, except Jesus. As he's walking to the tomb, he stops, and what does he do? Shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five, 35, I think it is. Jesus wept. He stopped and cried with them because they were hurting, and they were confused, and they were angry at him and angry at God. How many times does Jesus weep with you and you don't even know it? For whatever reason, he can't take you out of the situation right now, but he still weeps with you. When Jesus hung on the cross, gasping for breath, and the Father is looking down, having all power in the universe to simply snap his fingers and vaporize all the soldiers and pull Jesus off the cross and heal him, but not being able, in one sense, by his own will, to do it. Why? Because if he had taken Jesus off that cross, we go to hell. Can you imagine? Parents, grandparents, your kid suffering like that, and you know that if you stop it, you have the power to stop it. But if you do, billions are damned. And you let it go. See, there are times God does not act in the way we think he should because there's a higher purpose that we don't yet see. In heaven, there'll be times where we're going to be shocked and amazed about things that we've gone through and why God didn't stop it. 
but we do need to put our trust in him. Go back to verse four now, or verse one, I'm sorry. Exodus 14, verse one. So 10 different miracles have happened. The, the, the <laughs> Pharaoh has said yes and no and yes and no after being told by Moses, let my people go. He won't do it. He will do it. Then he won't do it. He starts, then he stops. And God has constantly demonstrated his power and his glory. And now Israel's finally walked out of Egypt and they've got all these riches and wealth that they've been given by the Egyptians who just want to get rid of them now. It seems to be over. They're home free, right? Maybe not yet. Exodus 14, verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Pi-Hiroth between Migdal and the sea opposite baal Zephon. Now, what's interesting about this location, I think we have a map we'll show you here in a second. It's, it's, a, it's a trap. I mean, there's no way out of where they're headed. And, interestingly enough, that baal Zephon is a mountain which symbolized to the pagan nations the epicenter of Baal worship, the demon, Baal, to whom they offered children in sacrifice. So not only is Israel trapped, they're facing, symbolically, their spiritual enemy in the front and the Egyptian army behind them. And as you can see where that little red dot is, there are mountains on both sides. There's nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. And God leads them there. What, what, does God not have a map? I mean, did he have a momentary blip in his omniscience? Or is there something else happening? So he tells Moses, take the people there. And he says, you shall camp before it by the sea, verse 3. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land and the wilderness has closed them in. And then God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army. Notice why. That the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And it says, and so they did so. Now there's a ton packed into those verses. Let me talk about one thing first. Hardening his heart. Some people like to say, you see, God's sovereignty made Pharaoh do this. Because God, that's how God, everything bad that happens, it's God's will. He does everything, good and bad and all the above. Well, let's talk about that. We don't have time to go through it, but if you go back and you read the story of the Exodus, you'll find that the first several times that Pharaoh does what he does, there's no mention of his heart being hearted by God. He's just a bad dude who thinks he's God because that was how the Egyptians treated Pharaoh and what they believed. And so he does what he wants, and it's evil, and he's punishing Israel, and he's abusing Israel long before this story even begins. And when Israel argues and God begins to do these plagues to set them free, he makes it even tougher. He takes away the materials for making bricks and doubles the workload with no materials. They had to go find their own materials and then make more bricks. He's a bad dude. Now, in that process, at some point, it does say God hardened his heart. But here's what's interesting. You ever, you ever make clay or see how clay pots are made? When you harden a clay pot, what happens? Does it change shape? No. It stays in the shape you made it in. When it's in a certain shape and you harden it, it remains a cup, a pot, whatever it was, a plate. So when God hardens Pharaoh's heart, is he making Pharaoh a bad guy? No. He's just locking Pharaoh into what's already part of his character that he's already chosen and lived out for years to prove a point. But here's the other thing, and this is a big lesson, and we need to think of this, guys. We don't. We get so caught up and we're so upset when things go wrong. What's the purpose here? That the Egyptians would know, God says, that I'm God, not Pharaoh, me. You see, this is, this is an evangelistic outreach here. God is letting this happen, not for Israel's sake, but for the sake of the Egyptians that they would realize, listen, this guy, Pharaoh's not your God. I am the Lord Jehovah. He's, he's God. How many times has God let stuff happen to you and you and you and you and me? And we don't understand it. But what's going on behind the scenes is God is trying to make an impact in the lives of someone around you that's going to watch what happens and see your faith and go, oh my gosh, 
What an amazing, what a mighty, what a powerful God you serve. And that brings me to the second point. We've got to refuse to panic and stop assuming the worst. But don't we often do that? I mean, we have people in life, and you probably know them, don't point at anyone now, who are professional warriors. <laughs> professional warriors, I mean, not warriors, maybe that too. But professional warriors. They can find something to worry about, right? They can snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory. They will find something. That my mother was this way. She would worry about, and, and I mean, it didn't matter. Things could be perfect, and she'd find something to fret and worry about. We used to tease her, and we'd actually come up with stuff for her, which was not helpful at all. But, you know, we'd, say, you know, we'd go out and go fishing, and, well, Mom, the boat could sink, you know, whatever. <laughs> Real helpful. I know. That's terrible. But, oh, you're right. It could. Mom, we're just kidding. Mom, really, we're fine. The boat's good, really. And, and, and we do this. But there's always something positive. I mean, you know, for example, skydiving. You know, if your parachute doesn't open, you've got the rest of your life to try to figure out how to fix it. You know, there's always a positive way to look at things, right? <laughs> Think of it that way. It may not be that long, but you've got the rest of your life to figure it out. 2 Timothy 1.7, what does it say? God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. We need to focus on God's love. First John 4, 18, what happens? He says, perfect love drives out fear, pushes it away. How does that happen? It happens by prayer, but it's not just talking prayer. See, this is a problem. <laughs> and, and I guess on that one extreme, the one that's, you know, we got to do is name and claim it and pray hard enough and believe hard enough, it's going to go away, blah, blah, blah. That extreme, here's what happens with, with us over here. And probably many of us, myself included, are more on that extreme than the other one I mentioned. We talk God's ear off as if somehow, if we just pray long enough and say enough words, God's going to go, okay, all right already, ah, I'll do it, just fine. We imagine that when Jesus went up into the mountain all night to pray, that he spent 8, 10, 12 hours just going on and on and on. Well, Father, you know, there's this one there. I and mean, Peter's kind of a problem. But, I, you know, James and John, they're okay. They're a little excited. Well, and sometimes I get really out of control. And I don't know what it is. For 8 or 10, 12 hours, and then finally, oh, the sun's up. Okay, bye-bye. We'll, we'll see you later, Father. Amen. You really think that's what happened when Jesus went in the mountain to pray? I don't. Oh, I'm sure he talked to his father but I'm more sure that he listened more than he spoke. You ever try to have a conversation with somebody that won't stop talking? We have a friend like that, spent some time with her recently. I'm serious, I am not exaggerating. I could not get a word in. It was like, you know, I, finally just say, I give up. And then they find, oh, I'm out of time, got to go, bye-bye. I mean, that's crazy, right? But some of us do that to God. You ever wonder if there are times when God is in heaven and he's going, would you stop talking for a minute? Just listen. I have some things to tell you. And, and just be silent in his presence. And let the Holy Spirit speak. And let him lead us into the word. Because I think sometimes we miss it because we're talking over him. Again, I'm not opposed to talking in prayer or long prayers. Please don't mishear me. But sometimes we just need to listen to him. And that's why the perfect love takes over. And that's where the fear gets pushed out. And that's where the panic subsides. And that kind of prayer, listening as well as speaking. Okay, number three. Here's another one that we, try, we struggle with. This. When God opens a door, run through it. Run through it. Sometimes, we, and, and I chose the New King James on purpose because it's, it's a translation that we often use, stand still and see the salvation of your Lord. Like, like the most faithful thing to do is just sit there. You know, God's going to just do something. I need a job, but I'm not going to apply for one because God will just take care of it. You know, I, I, I got a health problem, but I'm not going to go seek any counsel or wisdom or go to the doctor. Or nope, I'm just, God's going to heal me. I'm just waiting. 
It's like the old joke about the guy caught in the flood. The waters are rising. and God, save me. People come by in a rowboat. He's, nope, God's going to deliver me. Later, a helicopter comes over, you know, rescue. First day, you know, they start to drop. The, oh, no, God's going to save me. And eventually, the water rises. He gets swept off the roof. He drowns. When he gets to heaven, he says, what, God, what, what happened? Why, why didn't you save me? He said, well, I sent you a boat, a helicopter, a bunch of rescue people. What were you waiting for? There are times when we just don't get it. The words here, stand still, actually is kind of a mistranslation of the Hebrew. It literally, some of you, if you notice different translations that you may have in your lap, you might notice that many translations say, be still. Now that's different than stand still, isn't it? Why would he say, be still and see the salvation of the Lord in the context of what we just read? Because they were complaining. Because they were fussing and arguing and pouting. Oh, here, well, well let, let's, let's see. There's more to it. Verse 13. Did we read verse 13? No, we did not. Let's read verse 13. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you see again no more. We read that before. Yes, we did. Now look down at verse 14. The Lord will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. Now that's right. In other words, zip it, Israel. Quit complaining. Quit negativity, negatively discussing and, and, and arguing and pouting. Zzz, be silent. Okay, but then verse 13, uh, 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? He, you know, hey, Mo, I already told you what was going to happen. I already told you, Moses, what I was going to do. Why are you crying out now like this is some shock? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. What do you mean go forward? I thought you were supposed to stand still. No, they were supposed to be still, but move forward as God leads. And that's what happens. Let's keep going. Lift up your rod, stretch it out over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army and his chariots and his horsemen. And then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And I won't continue to read, but you know the story. And isn't it interesting? We said, and we saw here again, this is the second time God says this. He's doing this to reach the Egyptians, to love the Egyptians, to demonstrate himself to the Egyptians. And over thousands of years now, how many times has this story been told? How many times have people been lifted up and encouraged by the story of Israel and the Red Sea? How many movies have been made? There are secular people who can't spell Bible, but they know the story of Israel crossing the Red Sea, don't they? How'd God do with that project? How do you do with that goal of testifying that he is God, not Pharaoh? I'd say pretty good. And if you were an Israelite at the time, you'd be thinking, God's just boxed the in. He's going to take us out. Why did he do this? And that's what they say. That's how they complain. They're fussing. They're complaining. They're concerned. They're arguing. I mean, we skipped over that. But verse 10, let's go back to verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone, <laughs> that we might serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. I'm sure none of you have ever said anything like that to God. But I have. Why are you putting me through this? Why haven't you rescued me? Why didn't you stop this? And there are times when the answer is not immediately clear, just as it wasn't for them. But we know the answer. The answer was that he would reveal himself to this wonderful, powerful nation, a ruling world empire at the time in Egypt. And so he did. And so he did. Yeah, when God opens the door, we need to run through it, not freeze, not be lazy, 
but go, move, and see the salvation of the Lord. Last point, number four. We have to trust in the Lord and those who lead us to follow him. Trust in the Lord as well as those who lead us to follow him. Skip down to verse 31, last verse of the chapter. You know the story. Sea opens up. Israelites cross. Pharaoh has his army charge into the sea. Boom! God slaps it closed, wipes them out. By the way, they've even found archaeological evidence of Egyptian armaments at the bottom of that sea. This is a fact. This isn't just a story somebody made up. So, you know, God fulfilled his word. But notice what he says, verse 31, in summarizing this, Moses writes, Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. You see, there are times in our culture today where we think it is more righteous to kind of be independent Christians. In fact, it's probably considered very righteous to kind of assault and attack verbally Christian leaders, pastors in particular. I see this every day in the work I do. Because we think somehow that we've been given license because we stand before Christ and we're forgiven by Him and we confess to Him directly, not through a mediary, right? That that somehow means we don't need leaders anymore. I was interviewed on the radio recently. And, and was asked, well, what about people that just stay home and it's just them, the Bible, and their coffee table, and Jesus? I said, well, some people can't go. I get that. But you know what? Jesus, when he said, I will build my church, I don't think that he had in mind a bunch of independent Christians at their coffee table with their Bible. I suspect that that and the early New Testament era and everything written by Paul and Peter and James and others reflects community and time together, fellowship. Hebrews 13 even says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the habit of some is, or Hebrews 10, I should say. Don't do it. And in fact, it says, assemble more often as you see the day of the Lord getting closer. Hello? It's getting closer. Have you noticed? So this idea that we throw rocks at the leaders and stay alone by ourselves is not from God. You see, God tells us here that part of the fruit of this battle wasn't just that he showed himself sovereign over Egypt and over Pharaoh, but the people learned to trust him more and trust the one he had placed in charge. Now listen, that doesn't mean we trust leaders to do evil. We don't trust leaders to tell us everything or run our lives or be abusive. But it does mean, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, follow me as I follow Christ. And so our pastors need us to follow them as they follow the Lord and know that we've got their backs and that we're not just looking for an excuse to throw rocks. Trust in the Lord and those who he leads and who he has put in place to, to lead you to him and with him. So where do you need to trust him more? What are you going through right now? Your job, your money, your health, what is it? Where do you need to see the, 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 the reality that sometimes God allows this for a higher purpose? Where is it that you need to refuse and reject panic but spend more time in prayer, but listening prayer? Where is it that God may be opening doors and you haven't moved? Maybe you're afraid to move. Or you just need to go knock on some doors to see if one opens because he will, but he's waiting for you to get off your keister, so to speak. That's a Hebrew word for no, no. Right? Where do you need to trust him? Where do I need to trust him more? You ever do a trust fall? Anybody here ever do a trust fall? You know what it is? Yeah. They do it in ropes courses. They do it in team building exercises. It's where you, sometimes you're standing and there's a couple behind you and you, you're blindfolded or whatever and you, you say falling and they say fall away and then you just tip right over and they catch you. And it takes trust to believe that they're going to catch you and not just let you hit the ground. Sometimes they do it on a platform where you're up off the ground. I did it once with a bunch of junior high kids and I was about five feet off the ground. 
blindfolded, and they're standing in a row, two, two rows, like this. I made a mistake before I put the blindfold on of turning around and looking at them. That was bad. <laughs> that was not good, because what I saw was, <laughs> didn't help me, and I trust. Made me a little nervous. They caught me, though. We lived to fight another day. There are times when God will have you fall, but trust him to catch you. I, I don't like that. I'm not up here preaching it like, oh, this is fun. You know, I love being trapped by the Egyptian army and mountains and Baal and, you know, I, I, no, it's not fun. But is it important? Sometimes it is. Not just for us. Sometimes it's not about you. Tell somebody else that you didn't talk to already. Look at somebody else right now and say, it's not always about you. Tell them that. It's not always about you. Sometimes it's about somebody else you don't even know yet. You ever wonder if there are times God lets something happen in your life because there's somebody you're going to meet 10 years from now who's going to say to you, you can't understand what I'm going through because you've never experienced anything like this. And you're going to say what? Oh, yes, I have. Why? Because God didn't stop it even though he could have. Because he's above time and he already knew that that conversation was going to take place. I'm feeling this right now, but I'm going to tell you, I think you need to hear this. He wants you to know that it still breaks his heart when that happens. When he says no to you for that person 10 years down the road, it breaks his heart. But he loves you and them and others too much. Just like he loved you enough to leave Jesus on the cross. And so he lets it go. So these are some things we need to pray about, amen? That we would be prepared to respond correctly when we feel trapped. Let's do it. Lord Jesus, your ways are not our ways. And your thoughts are not always our thoughts. And your priorities sometimes escape us. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for the times we complain and argue and panic and pout. Help us to hear your voice and see your purpose in things, even when it's hard, especially when it's hard. Church, if there's something you need to lay down today that you've been responding to wrongly, <laughs> situation you haven't responded to the way you should have, I'm going to give you a second to do that. Lord, hear our prayer as we repent and just turn over the stuff that we worry about and help us to hear your voice in terms of reassurance and how to, how to react. Go ahead, lift those things to him. If there's something that you feel trapped in that's been bothering you, you need to let go of, take a minute, just do it right now. We're just going to wait a minute for you to do that. Lord, we pray for your patience and for understanding. And we thank you that the result would be that you would be lifted up and honored as we get ready for this Back to Church Sunday. Maybe there's some people that we can influence by what we're going through right now that could come and be saved and transformed. Help us, God, to be that kind of witness. But whatever your purpose, may it be filled, and may we give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor as we love you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Amen.